Well, good morning. morning. Great to get together today. Some uh, good announcements to share. Um, The first is congratulations to Sidney Fredrickson and Max Miller, who were married yesterday over by Milford, and we celebrate with Mike and all as they uh, they rejoice in this 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 new life that they are starting together. Um, Also, got some news about church cleaning, and this is coming from the folks at Good Hope. Church cleaning is available for you now up until the end of the month of August. So if you are a Good Hope member, um, I encourage you to talk to Margaret. She will fill you in on some of the details. But there is a table full of cleaning supplies, details about the jobs that need to be done for families who are going to be um, helping to uh, to the church cleaning. And um, so just see Margaret, though, if you have any questions. And I hope everybody knows who Margaret is. Raise your hand, Margaret. Yeah, yeah. So if you're from Good Hope, just just be aware that that's something that is coming up this month. Also want to let you know that plans are um, taking shape for church cleaning for St. John's, and more details will be coming about that, or that's actually on page 11 in the bulletin. Um, We do have Bible study tomorrow night, and that's at St. John's, and our summer Bible study this year has been about prayer, and we're going to be talking about Jesus' high priestly prayer tomorrow. That's the prayer Jesus prayed the night before he died. And so I want to encourage you to come and join us for that if you can. Any other announcements to share? Any other announcements? Going once, going twice. All right. So um, we've been doing a pick your own hymn um, opening, and we try not to stump Karen, although it's really hard. Um, so, what are two songs you would love to hear to, to begin our time together today? Five four three. What's the name? Praise to the Lord. Five forty Seven forty six in the blue? What's the name of it? Day by day. day. Seven forty six in the blue, day by day, and let's stand together.
And we continue on page two in the bulletin. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let's pray together. And the prayer is printed in the middle of page five. O oh God, eternal goodness, immeasurable love, you place your gifts before us. We eat and are satisfied. Fill us in this world in all its needs with a life that comes only from you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Would you please be seated? Good morning. Our first reading for today is from 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 26 through 12 and 13a. God sends the prophet Nathan to rebuke King David for his abuse of power in taking Bathsheba and killing her husband Uriah. Confronted with his sin, David repents. This sin, however, <clears throat> excuse me, marks the beginning of troubled times in David's family. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guests who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom and gave you the house of Israel and, Ju and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. The word of the Lord. Be Our psalm that we will read responsively this morning is Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. For I know my offenses, and my sin is ever before me. Indeed, I was born steeped in wickedness, a sinner from my mother's womb. Remove my sins with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be purer than snow. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my wickedness. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with your 
We continue with a noisy offering, and during the offering, we will sing Glories of Your Name Are Spoken. It's in the LBW number 358. Our second reading for this morning is in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Christians share fundamental unity and diversity. Our unity consists in the one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God. Our diversity is expressed in various forms of the ministry, whose goal is equipping the saints and building up Christ's one body. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg to you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean? But that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's tri trickery, 
by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. The word of the Lord. A reading from the Gospel of John. Glory to you, O Lord. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus or his disciples were beside the sea, they themselves got into boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found Jesus on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you, because you saw, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And please, we said, I'd love to invite the kids here to come on up right now. you guys good morning it's yeah it's just you guys this time all right so um have a seat so i got a question do you guys like ice cream yes. do you like ice cream all right um anybody out there like ice cream Ooh. all right um now specific kind of ice cream do you like um when i think they call them dream pops there it's like it's like a popsicle but instead of a popsicle it's ice cream covered in chocolate no, it's not chocolate. It's from vanilla covered with chocolate coated. Mm. Yeah, not a twist even. But, oh, oh, how about another kind of ice cream? Do you like chocolate sandwiches or ice cream sandwiches? Like, like the, like, like, like the, like, it, you like, I guess like the cup. Oh, well, not, well, you like ice cream like that in a cup and a cone? Do, yeah. Do. You too, you too, you too. All right, so if you get ice cream, do you wait to eat it or do you eat it right away? I wait. You, you wait? Uh oh, does any uh oh, does anybody out there wait to eat their ice cream? Ah, uh -uh. they're shaking their head. No, I, I want to see who here. Because what happens? 
Oh, you eat it in the car as yeah, you're leaving. So okay, gotcha. You kind of wait, but not really. So, so what happens when you get ice cream? What does it start to do? It starts to melt. Now, why is it melting? Because it's, it's too hot outside and the ice cream is just... And it's a frozen liquid, yeah, so it's just going to melt. Now, now I want to roll with this. If it's very hot. If it's very hot. It melts. Yeah, it melts. And you get sticky, yeah. And messy. And messy, yeah, you get sticky and messy. So I, I want to talk about this because Jesus says he's going to give us stuff that will never melt. Stuff that'll never go away. Like ice cream. Well, you think about ice cream, yeah, because ice cream, what does it do? It melts. It gets your ice cream cone gets soggy. If you if you can make a miracle. Well, yeah, he can make a miracle. But you know what he says? He's gonna give us stuff that's never gonna go away. But what happens if you make a miracle? What happens well that's what God does all the time. God makes miracles all the time. So so Jesus is saying, I'm gonna give you a promise. And my promise isn't going to melt like ice cream. My promise is going to be with you always. He uses a big word to describe that. He calls it imperishable. That means his word, his promises are never going to die. They're going to be with you and me and everybody out there forever. So like an ice cream cone is only good for one day, right? And it's not even good for a whole day. It's only good for like five minutes because then it's melty and you're messy but the promises of god they go with us forever so let's fold our hands we'll bow our heads dear jesus thanks for your love your love that never ends amen thanks a lot you guys O oh, grace and peace to your friends from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is, was, and will be the Christ. Amen. So what does it mean to speak for God? Let's just get thinking about this. We say Scripture is God's Word. We say that God's Word is going to be with us and that God's promises don't ever come to an end. Think about it. What does it mean to trust in God's promises? And how do we know who to listen to? Because some people who claim to speak for God, you know, I'm kind of suspicious. I'm kind of wondering, really? Really? Sincerely? There's an old story. An elderly lady was well known for her faith, and she had her boldness in talking about it. And she would stand on her front porch and shout, Praise the Lord! And next door to her lived an atheist, and he lived next to her for years, and he would get so angry at her proclamations every morning, praise the Lord, and he would shout back, there ain't no Lord. And hard times set in for this older lady, and she prayed to God to send her some assistance. She stood on her porch and shouted, praise the Lord God, I need food, I am having a hard time, I need some food, please Lord send some groceries. The next morning the lady went out on her porch and saw a large bag of groceries and she shouted, praise the Lord. The neighbor jumped up from behind a bush and said, ha ah, ah, ha, I told you there's no Lord, I bought those groceries. And she just started jumping up and down and clapping. Praise the Lord. Not only did he send me groceries, but he made the devil pay for it. <laughs> Who works on God's behalf? Who speaks for God? And who are we actually going to listen to to let it get close enough into us that they might do something to transform who we are. So in our story from, from, from the Old Testament today, we are hearing about a man called Nathan and a man called David. And David, David needed somebody to speak to him. David's conscience, you could say, was sound asleep and he needed someone to come in and wake him up. And this man called Nathan 
came in speaking on God's behalf. Nobody knows when Nathan was born or when he died. We don't know anything about his family background or which tribe he called his own among Israel's 12 tribes. But that doesn't really matter. What matters for us and for history is what Nathan had to say to the most powerful man in his nation, a king named David. Nathan was called to speak the truth. Nathan came to the king as God's messenger. Now when King David wanted to build a temple for God, it was Nathan who told him no. God called Nathan with another message. This was a harder message. His first message to David, that was beautiful. Don't build the temple. Your son, someday future king, David, your son will build a temple for God. But now Nathan had a different word to share with King David. It was a message for the king about the king's sin. His sin was finally going to catch up to him. You might have heard the first part of the story. David, the beloved king of Israel, was in deep trouble and he was getting in over his head. David thought he had covered up his sin, that nobody would ever be the wiser. But the facts of the story are clear. David saw a woman named Bathsheba. David used prestige and power to bring him into his palace and his motives were not good. He had what some call an affair with Bathsheba. Other commentators wonder if Bathsheba had any choice in the matter or could have even said no to this king at all. Could a soldier's wife really have said no to the all-powerful king? The fact is, David abused his power. Bathsheba's husband, Uriah the Hittite, was out in the field when the army... When the army was in battle and David was back in the capital when he saw Bathsheba and brought her into his palace. When David learned that Bathsheba was pregnant, he tried to cover up the pregnancy and after a multiple attempts at covering up, David decided that executing Uriah but making it look like a battle death was the plan. Then after Uriah was gone, David took Bathsheba into the palace, and nobody said anything to the king. Probably looked to David like he had gotten away with it. Nobody protesting. But would anybody dare confront an all-powerful and increasingly autocratic king who just ordered a man killed in battle to cover it up? Would anybody have the courage to tell the truth to this king when his generals just followed orders? Throughout history, there have been plenty of kings who didn't want to know the truth. Many people who have often played along with the desires of powerful men in order to gain access to power themselves. So everybody's quiet. They all know what happened. Your eye is pregnant. Your eye is gone. Bathsheba's pregnant. David is now living with her as one of his wives. And everybody's quiet, except for this prophet called Nathan. We don't know much else about Nathan. But he had a message about sin. Now John Bayless says that sin will take you farther than you want to go. Sin will take you there faster than you want to get there. And sin will cost you more than you want to pay. Nathan had to get to the heart of this king. So Nathan came to David with a story about two men. Nathan's story was tailor-made for David. See, deep down, David was a good king. Deep down, David cared about the poor in his soul. David cared about justice and the rights of the powerless. And God sent Nathan to awaken the soul of this now failing king. Nathan told David a story. If you want to grab that first reading in your bulletin today, it's a really good story. It's 
So Nathan's got to get into David's heart. So Nathan is going to tell him a parable. It picks up there in verse 1 of chapter 12. There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. He used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to a rich man who was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared for the guest, that for the guest who had come to him. Nathan Taylor made this story for David. It went straight to David's heart, straight to his conscience. I feel like David had been hitting the snooze button on his conscience over and over again. Remember, deep down, David had a passion for justice. Remember, deep down, David was a shepherd boy who had become king. He knew what it was to be on the bottom, to be the little brother. Deep down, this man who had committed so much sin was still a man who at one point had loved his people and his nation. Nathan told this story and it woke David up. David's now wide awake. He was angry. How dare somebody in his country treat a poor person that way? When David was king in Israel, the poor would be safe from exploitation. In his soul, David cared about justice. How dare somebody think they could exploit somebody this way? The powerful pushing down, neglecting the dignity of the poor neighbor. David is wide awake now. He said he'd make this man pay four times the cost that he had inflicted on his poor neighbor. And that's when Nathan got to give what some commentators say is the clearest line a prophet ever got to speak to a king. You are that man. Now David, who'd been asleep, who'd been hitting the snooze button on his conscience for all this time, he could see all the evil that he had done. Nathan woke up David's sleeping conscience. David is starting to realize all the evil that he has committed. David awake to the truth of his sin. Nathan made it clear that nothing David had done was hidden from God. David had been in some self-induced stupor asleep in the power of his own authority, drunk on himself. David had forgotten there's always a greater authority than an earthly king. Think about all the despots through history who believed they were mighty and powerful. David may have well been on his way to becoming a tyrant, but somehow, some way, this prophet could still reach him and awaken his sleeping conscience. Now Nathan spoke of God's coming judgment, judgment for David. The prophet said David's reign would end in disgrace. God's wrath could be coming right now even for this beloved king. When David heard God's judgment, he turned back to God. He confessed, I have sinned against the Lord. Real confession isn't easy. It wasn't easy for David. It certainly isn't easy for any of us or anyone we know. My dad always used to say, you know, confession is good for the soul. And he's right. Confession is good for us. But it is so hard for us. See, God wanted to actually set David free, but God had to come to terms with David, and David had to come to terms with God about what David had done. In the Augsburg Confession, Philip Melanchthon wrote, Properly speaking, true repentance is nothing else than to have contrition and sorrow or terror on account of sin. That word terror might bug you. We want to think of God as loving and gracious. 
But David, David in this moment realized he had nothing to offer to God. God was rightly judging David for his many sins. We want God to be okay with whatever we do. But the truth is God sees it all and David's sin was clear to the Almighty. There was no space to argue, no bargaining with God for David. The real David was face to face with the very real God. Trusting that God can take our broken parts and make us whole again isn't easy. To all the people around him, King David looked and sounded like a king. But to God, to God, this great King David was just another sinner in need of grace. Think about David in this moment. Not as a king, but as a soul in the hands of God. No place to hide, no place to run, no place else to go. We're talking about the God of Scripture, the living God. The God who spoke to Nathan. We are talking about the God who sees everything, who knows everything, the details of our life, who sees all of it. Nothing's hidden. Not from God. Nothing's secret. Not the inmost part of your heart. Even the great king, the greatest king Israel ever knew was still 100% dependent on God. So many twists, so many turns. And then comes God's grace and mercy. There's a line we've been singing all summer long. And you may not even recognize that it's in our psalm today. It's on page 6 in our bulletin. We've been singing these words all summer long. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Some people like to attribute this psalm to David, coming to terms with who he was, coming to terms with his own need to have God make him new. And this is what it means for us to come to God, to sing these words over and over again, Sunday after Sunday, create in me a clean heart, O God. Put a new spirit within me. Don't push me away, O God. Restore me, O God. Bring me back to your joy. How do you think of David now? Mighty king, sinner pleading for mercy and grace. The story ends with God sparing David's life. But the child, the first child born to David in Bathsheba would die. Oh, this story, it bugs me now. This innocent child dying. Start to wonder why. What did this child do? I start to think about how sin really works and all the things that we put our trust in. And Jesus says, don't put your trust in things that are going to perish. Don't put your trust in anything that is going to to fail. Trust that God will somehow, some way provide. Even when you have been broken, even when you have been the one doing the breaking and the sinning, part of faith is learning that God will keep on providing. New life, second chances, forgiveness, Third chances, new life, fourth chances. How many times Jesus' friends asked, should we forgive? Jesus says seven times 70. How many times does God forgive you and me? This is the promise. The one who comes to give us something that will never be taken away. The one who says, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. And for that good news, I give thanks and praise, and I say glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, as now and ever shall be, or that end. Amen.
join in our hymn. It's number 403 in the greens. Lord, speak to us that we may speak. Number 403. Join and confess our faith today. We use the words of the Apostles' Creed. It's on page 65 on the front part of the Green Book. And please stand if you're able. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let's take time for confession and to hear a word of God's forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And may the peace of the Lord be with you always. And take some time and share a sign of God's peace with the people around you.
Let's join in our offertory. As God's people, we're called to pray in every season, so today we pray for the church, the world, and all of God's creation. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the blessing of your word, your word which never ends, your promises which are always true. Help us to come to you for new life, for new hearts, for forgiveness, for mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, teach us to speak your word in this world that needs it. Teach us to speak your promise of new life for all the world, for all people, for forgiveness, for mercy is the gift you've given us. Help us learn to share it, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of all nations, we pray for our nation and all nations of the world. We pray that all people may know the blessings of your mercy and your justice. Hear us, O God, as we pray for nations at war. Ukraine, Russia, Gaza, Israel. Hear us, O God, as we pray for your peace. Your peace in our hearts. Your peace in our spirits. Your peace in our homes and in our families. Your peace around this world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of new beginnings, we give you thanks for Sydney and Max who celebrated their marriage yesterday. And we ask your blessings on all marriages. Strengthen us all as your people, O oh God. Strengthen us in our families, in our homes, as moms and dads, as brothers and sisters, as parents and children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, hear us today as we pray for healing healing for the earth, healing for those whose lives have been turned over by water and wind, healing for Roberta, for Gabby, for Jerry, for Lisa, for Avon, for Doris, for us, for all others who we name before you now. You are the healer of every ill, and we place ourselves and all the people we love into your care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And hear us, O oh God, as we pray today for those who know grief. Help us, Lord Jesus, to see in you our peace in this world and our way into life eternal. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray. Trusting in your mercy revealed through Jesus, who taught us to pray as one people, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we go with God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. So go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God.
We close with number 170, crown him with many crowns. Number 170. <laughs> 